Hi, this is Phil Simon of the Huffington Post, and today I'm pleased to be joined again by Mr. Steve Rothery of Marillion. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, thanks, Phil. How are you? No complaints, my friend. Um, let's talk a little bit about the new Marillion album, and then we'll focus most of our time today on your first book, and, and hopefully not your last. Um, but Fear is, uh, what, about three months away now? Uh, yes, yeah, September the 23rd, I think it is. Um, so yeah, very exciting times. Um, we're incredibly proud of it. Uh, I think it's quite a remarkable record. Um, yeah, I think it's going to surprise a few people. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a challenge to play it live. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys are up for a challenge. Um, no one's really heard it yet other than very few people, including you. But uh, generally speaking, um, from what I've read about it, it's, I don't know if dark is the right word, but um, can you talk a little bit about how recent world events have influenced the theme of the album, the lyrics and the music? You seem like you have something big to say here, hence the title. Well, I, they weren't so much influenced by very recent events as, uh, you know, the ongoing, um, well, it, it depends, the different lyrics in the songs. Uh, yeah, I mean, El Dorado, um, very much, I suppose, influenced by the, uh, the immigrant crisis across Europe. Um, you know, New Kings. Um, yeah, it, it, it's um, quite a strong social commentary, really, on, on uh, capitalism, I suppose, and, and the, uh, the way the rich seem to, can, seem to be able to get away with anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, ha ha has the titles been released yet? I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to talk about each individual song, if, if, but I think they've been released on, uh, on the pledge campaign, haven't they? I don't, I don't know if they've been generally released. But anyway, right. um, the, the, there's a track called Leavers, which is about touring, really, which uh, goes back. It's actually called The Leavers and the Remainers in the lyrics, which this is ironic given the, the current state of the uh, UK's relationship with the... Uh, EU, um, but uh, yeah, it predates that by a very long time. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's a very strong record. It really, is very very strong. It seems like you're touching on big themes, like you've had, in, say, in songs like Seasons End, in songs like Gaza. You guys really aren't afraid to back away from something that maybe some other bands wouldn't even consider touching. No, absolutely. I, I think Steve's lyrics on this album are, are, are some of the strongest I've ever heard. You know, he, he really has uh, delivered, I think, on this record. And, uh, and the music perfectly complements it, you know. And it's the music's given space to breathe as well. Um, you can tell because we have 16-minute tracks, 20-minute tracks. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of music on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned on Facebook, I think a couple of weeks ago, that while listening to Fear, um, you thought about how your own playing on Ghosts of Pripyat had really influenced your playing here. Can you talk a little bit about how that kind of led into uh, the development of your guitar parts on the new Marillion album? Well, we write a lot by jamming. Um, and I think what's happened to certain sections as we've jammed around them, if, if I was uh, in the zone, I would... Uh, you know, just play for quite a long time uh, and improvise various melodies and themes. Uh, and Mike's taken a lot of these really and uh, and developed them and sometimes rearranged them and, and orchestrated them almost. So, um, yeah, there's the most instrumental music in a Marillion album there's ever been. Uh, but that, in a way, that kind of, when the lyrics come back in, 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 in the songs, it, it gives them even more impact because you've had that uh, almost cinematic you know, kind of change of, of mood and direction. But it's, yeah, it, it's going to be a, a very exciting album to, to play and to, to, you know, to watch us play, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, this song uh, that we're working on this week, New Kings, um, it's kind of like four, possibly five guitar solos. So trying to get all these straight in my head, um, it's a bit of a challenge, especially at my age. Yeah, I'm sure that you pull it off. Well, let's switch gears for a bit and talk about uh, your first book, Postcards for the Road. I know that um, in the book and, and just following you over the years, you've been taking photos for decades. But what finally prompted you to put the book together? And were the motivations for doing so similar to finally doing Ghosts of Pripyat after thinking about solo albums for, for a while now? 
Well, what happened now, I mean, this has been like an ongoing process for about the last 16 years since this sort of EMI remasters. Uh, but it was like a year and a half, two years now when I mentioned on Facebook that I was definitely going to do this. And I was trying to find ways of financing it and would anybody be interested in pre-ordering it. And over the course of a weekend, I had like four or five hundred pre-orders, mm. which um, enabled me to sort of move ahead with the with the idea. As it was, it's kind of like over a year later than I had anticipated, just because it sort of changed. Uh, my original plan was just to have one book and it'd be like the best of my photos. Um, but as I started putting together, I thought it, it would be more interesting for people if it was more like a photographic diary, really. Uh, and that if each period of, of, of time was given enough space to, to fully explore and, and explain um, so that's kind of what I, what, what I, I finished up doing. And you know, there's over 400 images in the book and I've got several thousand, well, probably tens of thousands of images. So sorting through, cataloging, scanning, um, tweaking, that's before we even get to the layout and, the, and trying to write the words to go with the pictures to, to make them in some way more poignant. Um, and then proofreading. I had no idea how much work proofreading was. I had a team of experts on it, and even then, even then it was right down to the wire. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, a, a great experience, and you know, I'm hoping. Um, what I've done, I've, I've actually made it a, a, a limited edition, so there'll only be three thousand copies uh, made uh, of the first volume. And uh, you know, if that does reasonably well, I'm, my plan is to have a second volume hopefully ready for the uh, Marillion weekends next year. That's my kind of plan, is to try and work on it on the road. Um, and uh, yeah, then the third volume, probably sometime sort of beginning of 2018, I would think. Okay. T talk to me a little bit about your selection process with the photos. Did you intentionally try to represent each album or error equally, or did you select the best or your favorite photos, really irrespective of time? Uh, no, I... I tried to keep it chronological. I tried to choose my favorite photos within each time frame, but I also used a lot of photos that I didn't think were particularly great photos, but that had a lot of historical interest. Mm. Uh, one of my first cameras in the early days, uh, I had a Pentax ME Super, and the, the metering, I don't think, was set up properly, and it, and it used to uh, underexposed quite constantly. So some of the shots were, were quite dark and I, you know, you can tweak the levels in Lightroom and Photoshop to a certain degree, but even so, you know, some of the images, I thought it was more important to have the images in there than to be the perfect images. That's what I was saying. It's not like uh, my best photos, but just, I thought the photos that best illustrated the narrative of, of, of the, this stage of my career. So kind of a warts and all look, even though yeah, um, there, there aren't any, I don't think, bad photos per se, but you know much more about photography than I do. Um, you wanted to accurately reflect uh, things and not just put in a photo that might look particularly good, but doesn't have a terrible amount of sentimental value for you. Yeah, and I think what's going to be interesting over the subsequent two volumes is I think my photography improved quite quite dramatically. The, the next volume starts with our time at... Uh, the chateau and the Dordogne, Miles Copeland's uh, chateau, Marouat. Um, and by then I really got into black and white infrared photography. So I, I took quite a lot of, quite sort of gothic imagery uh, at the chateau, which uh, a, lot, a lot of which people have never seen. So that's going to be an interesting insight, I think, as well. You mentioned that the cameras have improved and like everything else, the technology has improved. But as a photographer, talk a little bit about how the pictures you've taken have changed over time. Do you see what kinds of changes do you see from, say, the 80s to today when you snap a picture? Well, I, I, whenever possible, I like to shoot by available light. Um, and in the early days, that would mean usually using a, a 400 uh, SA slide film ectochrome and push processing it two stops up to 1600, uh, which can sometimes can make it quite grainy. Um, there's a mixture, you know, there's some sort of standard. It's, it was mainly ectochrome that I shot, though. Uh, which is probably slightly more bluish in, in, in tone a lot of the time than, than the Fuji films or the Kodachromes. Um, but then, you know, I kind of, I, I really got into black and white as well. So uh, I suppose the main 
the main movement really is towards the end of the second volume when, when the whole digital side starts to, to, to kick in. You know, uh, I'm going to have various, uh, this Pentax, then a couple of Canon cameras, then a, a, a Nikon, uh, and then onto the digital cameras. And, and although the early digital cameras maybe suffered a little bit from resolution, it was still great to be able to see if you've got the shot or if, you know, you needed to tweak something. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that, that that was quite a major advancement. You know, but then again, you look at the the scans of the slide film, and you have a texture and a quality, and the way that it it's the same as analog and digital recording. You know, uh, sometimes it's not all about capturing perfection. Sometimes it's about the way the end result looks. It's kind of maybe might be more interesting than it was at, at, in that moment of time. It's funny that you mentioned that. I was just watching an interview with Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters. And he was talking about how with technology, and I guess with Pro Tools in particular, you can get things perfect. And he said that should not be the goal. Uh, you want those imperfections in the music, and it sounds like you've adopted the same approach, not just to your own playing, even though um, sounds very good from my standpoint, but in terms of the photography, you're, you're really not working it perfect. No, no, you, you want something that, that, same with music, you know, that, that people have a sort of, you have emotional resonance with, really. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's a very, for me, the, the challenge with photography is kind of recognizing those little microseconds of time and capturing something that uh, just really sums up that moment. Uh, that's a kind of style of photography on the whole that I, I tend to gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite pictures in the book is, um, I don't know if it's from 85 or 86, but it's with a young Stephen Wilson in attendance. That blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, no, that was at the very first Marillion show, which would have been, I think, 1980. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's funny. Yeah. yeah well, were you was you were you aware of him back then, or did he just after so many years of getting to know him and, and work with him, um, did he come to just realize that he or he mentioned that he'd been to shows, or was he kind of a prodigy at age 10 or 12? No, no, no. I don't think he got into music until uh, he was quite a lot. To, older okay. um no um i became aware of uh of steve uh, i mean mark was going to work with him on, on on mark's solo project about 20 sort of 21 years ago i think that was a, probably the first time i met i met stephen but uh you know he's, he's a good friend of mine and we we kind of socialize quite regularly uh him and steve hackett Quite often we get together, the three uh, three guitarists, talk plectrums, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, no, he, he's a, quite a remarkable person, really. Yeah, yeah. It's funny how there are, uh, I guess, what, six degrees of separation, but in the prog world it's probably more like two, right? Yes, probably, yeah. yeah. Um, you, as you mentioned, you're not just putting pictures in a book. It's not a photo diary per se. It's a bit autobiographical. I was just wondering yeah. if in this project you had given any thought to at some point doing a proper autobiography or is this kind of the closest thing we'll see? This is probably the closest thing we'll see, purely because I probably can't remember most of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Having a photograph helps. It kind of like takes you back to a certain extent. And, and you know, I, I find myself looking uh, at the Marillion Tour archive to see uh, where, where in the world I was uh, quite often. <laughs> that, that was a real help putting together this book, I can tell you. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just been, I mean, just give, give you an idea. I mean, there's so much in that book, and that's just the first volume. You know, it's, it's quite exhausting when you look back and you realize exactly how, how much you've done. And, you know, I mean, that, that was up until, um, you know, how, how long, um, 20 or 23 years ago that stops that first volume so yeah trying to remember anything specific can, can sometimes unless you like like Steve Hogarth and, and write a diary um, but that in a way you know uh, for me taking photographs it is a way of documenting it without without the written word I suppose mm -hmm. so for volumes two and three I know you talked a little bit about the timing but um, you said this was a lot of work, but it sounds like you're very pleased with the result. Can we expect a similar length and format or in looking at the yes. physical book? Do you, you think you might make a few changes or? Um, not really. I mean, I think there's a learning curve involved with doing this. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm pretty happy with the book. I think I'm very happy with the quality. I think that I'd like all three volumes to be very much the same format. 
um, you know, the same size, same amount of pictures, uh, I think, uh, have like a uniform kind of uh, look and maybe sort of do like an overcase type binder for them, maybe. Um, but, yeah, no, the next book, like I say, I've learned a lot doing this one. So there, there, there'll be some things, some parts of the process I can speed up considerably. I mean, done the first one. And you had mentioned at one point that there would be an app to accompany the book. What's the status of that? Uh, well, that's kind of ongoing, really. There's um, there's a few things I need to do for the app. Um, and now the Marillion and album's finished. Uh, I'm going to try and get those sorted within the next sort of six or eight weeks. Uh, I'm hoping to have the book, uh, I mean, to have the app um, ready to launch towards the end of this year. But I haven't got a definite date yet. Okay. Well, again, Steve, great job on the book and can't wait to see you on tour. Um, You said that you'd be going to Barcelona soon, but the American tour starts, is it late September, early October? Uh, Yeah, mid-October, yeah. We start up in San Francisco. And this is the first time you've been here since, is it 2011 or 2012, I think? Uh, Again, I'd have to look at the Marillion online uh, tour diary, but um, (laughs) it was was just before Sounds That Can't Be Made came out, wasn't it? We we were actually finishing off the album as as we were sort of touring. Um, So whenever that was, 2013, I don't know. And you got um, Mr. John Wesley opening for you guys again. Yes, that's going to be great. Yeah, Wes is a, he's a great friend and a, a lovely guy. Great, great. Well, Steve, thanks so much for taking your time. Good luck with the book and, and good luck with the tour. Thank you very much. Good to speak to you. Cheers. Cheers.